Uh, so let's dive right in. Ms. Rothenberg, you're going to start with a presentation on the American Rescue Funds. Absolutely. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, morning. Uh, members of the public. It's my pleasure to be here to you today in front of you to provide an overview of the American Rescue Plan Act and its funding. So quickly, we're going to look at the allocation of funds that were provided, qualified uses of those funds given to us in the interim final rules, and the administration's recommendation for expenditure of those funds. So first, a quick, quick look. There was approximately $45.6 billion that was allocated to metropolitan cities. They um, came up with the dollar values by using the CDBG formula. The city's allocation was uh, 24 million and 24 million five hundred thirty thousand eight hundred and twenty dollars. As you're all aware, it's coming in two tranches. The first tranche we received in May. The second we anticipate to receive May 2022. So the monies can be spent for forward-looking expenses incurred from March 2021 forward. They have to be obligated before December of 2024 and spent by the uh, 2026. So there are four broad categories that are what's considered eligible expenditures of those dollars. The first are um, monies that are spent to respond to the public health emergency or its negative economic impacts. The second broad category is premium pay provided to eligible workers. There is another category for refunding lost revenues. And finally, uh, the category for expenditures in appropriate infrastructure projects, including water, sewer, and broadband. So the first category, the public health and negative economic impacts, it's looking at those services and programs that are used to contain and mitigate the spread of COVID-19. And there's some specifically enumerated examples of things that the interim rule provides are eligible expenses, but it's really just an illustrative list. There are other things that could be considered, but this is this uh, slide that's up shows you some of those things that are specifically identified as eligible expenditures. The rules also point out that the public health um, impacts and expenditures that are appropriate are those expenditures that are, provide services to address behavioral health care needs that are exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, payroll of covered benefits for uh, certain categories of employees, including public health, health care, human services, and public health and safety or similar, similarly situated employees. There's also a category of addressing negative economic impacts that were caused by the public health emergency, such as support for small businesses, assistance for workers and their families, speeding recovery of the tourism industry, travel industry, and hospitality sectors, and uh, importantly, rebuilding the public sector capacity. Finally, uh, in addressing negative health impacts and economic impacts, the rules stress a need to look at serving those hardest hit communities and families, looking at the disproportionate impacts of those individuals. And, and that type of thing. So those are all of the types of um, categories that we looked at when administration received the recommendations from the departments. Again, more negative impacts, looking at addressing educational disparities and promoting healthy uh, childhood environments. A quick look at the overview of premium pay. Premium pay is for essential workers. Um, it's limited to up to $13 an hour. That's above and beyond what the normal compensation rate is, and it's capped at $25,000 per worker. The uh, regulations also, again, encourage that uh, the payment should be prioritized toward your lower income workers to offset disproportionate impacts to those workers. 
they also require that the workers who are compensated are workers who are actually physically present, and those who are working via telework would not be eligible workers for the purpose of premium pay. The premium pay also allows for, um, or, or wants to, again, look at those folks who make less money. So if the proposed premium pay would provide income over 150% of the greater of the county or state annual average, then it would require written justification of the mayor in order to provide those uh, premium pay funds. And here we also have a list of some of those uh, categories that the rule says specifically are critical infrastructure sec sectors that would be eligible. But again, the rule provides the mayor with the authority to identify those employees that he believes are uh, fit within within the category. So the, the um, American Rescue Plan defines eligible workers as those workers needed to maintain continuity of operations of essential critical infrastructure sectors and additional sector as each governor of the state or territory or each tribal government may designate to protect the health and well-being of the residents of the state, territory, or tribal government. The interim rules and the direction that was entered following the definition that's contained in the act itself gives or extends what's listed here for the governor and the tribal governments to the mayor. So he then has the authority to identify those additional essential workers. The um, premium pay can be provided to government workers in addition to third party employees who also fit within those categories. Uh, Ms. Rothenberg, before you turn off that slide, uh, so this seems to defer to the governor for the definition of eligible workers. Do we have any such list from the state? The interim rules? No, the, this, the ARPA defines eligible workers, those workers needed to maintain blah, 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 in additional sectors as each governor may designate. Right, but, but all I'm saying to you is this provision from the American Rescue Plan Act yeah. as um, uh, further specified and clarified in the interim rules does it to apply to local government okay. workers. Okay, all right, so the, so the interim and rules bring it down to exactly. the local. Exactly, okay. and those additional workers that are identified by mayors who okay. are the appropriate right. persons of the government. So now we move to uh, replacing lost revenues, which is the third of the four categories that are eligible expenses. In this category, there is broad latitude to the government to identify what um, to spend those funds on. Specifically, the only thing that it, it requires specifically is that you can uh, support your services up to the amount of the lost revenue. It's really looking to make sure that governments are able to continue to provide to the residents the level of services that it was able to provide pre-pandemic. Uh, you can uh, use, obviously, those funds to avoid cuts in services. The funds are calculated by comparing the actual revenue uh, to an alternative of what should have been or could have been expected to occur in the absence of the pandemic. Those calculations are being uh, managed and handled by finance. There are some very specific rules and guidelines, pages and pages of them, which I'm sure you don't want to become intimately familiar with, but the um, finance department will provide the actual number of the lost revenue um, amounts that we will be anticipating uh, as in replacing as recommended by administration. The years that the fund allows us to recover for are December 31, 2020 through December 31, 2023, projecting out the additional lost revenues that it are calculated, again, based on formulas that are provided within the guidance documents. So the city um, may presume that all of the diminution of the actual revenue is, in fact, due to COVID-19 once those numbers are calculated. The final category that's outlined is investing in water, sewer, and broadband. Um, they're very specific uh, projects that the, again, the document, the guiding documents provide to us examples of things that would be appropriate expenditures. Uh, we received uh, several uh, recommendations from the utilities department, all of them 
uh, had pretty hefty price tags on them. You'll hear from the administration on that. Uh, broadband also is an eligible expenditure. We didn't have any needs in, in that regard within uh, the city from the IT department. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Faye to discuss with you all administration's recommendations unless there's specific questions to me. Any questions for the city attorney before she? Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good morning, Mayor, members of the board. Good morning. Staff and those in attendance. As it relates to administration's uh, recommendations, when we look at the four uh, categories, I want to start with the category that is not uh, recommended, and that is the uh, water sewer broadband. Uh, given the uh, estimated dollar uh, tickets that's attached to those staff recommendations, and also taking into consideration that uh, additional funding separate and apart from the rescue dollars uh, may be coming down the pack. We've determined that it would not be appropriate to consider uh, that category for American Rescue Funds. With that being said, uh, the recommendations uh, that we are bringing forward for consideration are, are the three listed on the slide. Uh, first, uh, to replace the lost revenue uh, that the city has experienced and continue to experience. Uh, I would just footnote for the board as part of, of the budget process to balance for FY21, we had to deal with the $7 million of revenue loss. Uh, so I don't want that to be lost on the board as a starting uh, place for uh, replacing lost revenue. Uh, the second category is uh, to provide premium pay uh, as we look at how the city was kept uh, moving forward during the pandemic, uh, we were able to keep uh, public safety operations uh, going as well as uh, building our inspections, uh, moving the city forward in terms of its uh, growth and development. Uh, so we have looked at the broad spectrum of classifications who played a critical role in helping to keep the city operational uh, during the pandemic and continues to do so. Uh, the third category uh, that we are recommending uh, is the category of public uh, health and neg negative economic impacts. I would like to point out uh, that we are not recommending any dollar amounts uh, attached to the three categories, and that is by design, uh, given that we have a public hearing uh, in uh, pending uh, that will affect uh, what we do by way of dollar amounts. What I would like to do, Mayor, is to have uh, on the replacement of the lost revenue, what is going to come forward by way of a recommendation is that the primary use of whatever dollar amount is allocated to this category be put toward vehicle replacement. As we sit right now, the city has about $8 million of critical vehicle replacement needs. That $8 million does not include the $2.2 million uh, vehicle replacement needs in the police department. And the board heard a presentation about the police uh, vehicle needs uh, here recently. I would like to have our support services director to give the board an overview of that. And then uh, as it relates to the premium pay, I would like to have the HR director uh, to do a brief presentation to the board on the various categories uh, that we are recommending be included uh, as it relates to premium pay. So with that, uh, Ms. Mr. Johnson, Mayor, if I may. Before you proceed there, I think you need to reiterate, because you kind of rushed through it, why we are not recommending amounts today. You, you need to emphasize the, the, the rationale for that, please. It's because of the fact <clears throat> that on the premium pay, we have a public hearing that is to be scheduled uh, that relates to uh, what the board is going to support uh, by way of, of the uh, union, uh, how much uh, the board is going to support in terms of what will be provided. So until that uh, matter is uh, solved. That's the public uh, hearing on the impasse, correct? Yes. And until that matter is uh, decided, 
uh, I don't think it is appropriate uh, for us to bring forward uh, dollar amounts given the vast number of categories of employees. I want to underscore that our recommendation is that we don't just provide premium pay to police and fire because police and fire, while a critical role in keeping the city going, the city was kept going by other employees. Sanitation continued to do their job. The building inspectors continued to do their job. Finance employees continue to have checks cut. So from my perspective, it is not appropriate for premium pay to be limited to public safety employees because the city was kept operational by a vast number of category of employees and I think it's inappropriate to discount their role in keeping the city moving forward. Okay, thank you. So with that, if I may have uh, Mr. Uh, Guzman to come up and give the board a brief uh, overview of the critical vehicle needs that we have for FY22. Good morning, Mayor James, commissioners. Good morning. Team members and members of the public. I'm Mario Guzman, the Director of Support Services. <clears throat> All right, overview, I'm going to talk about the history, um, some deferred replacements and maintenance costs, our current and the current fleet analysis we did, and some of what may happen in the future regarding the implications of not replacing equipment, delivery times, and city services affected. <clears throat> Little history, we did a quick comparison of replacement budgets versus maintenance budgets. Fiscal year 18, $300,000 for a replacement budget, our maintenance budget was about $4.8 million. Um, and this is all general fund. This is excluding the utility. This is for general fund vehicles um, and also excluding police. So 300,000 for uh, replacement budget, 4.8 maintenance, 500,000 in 2019, 6 million in maintenance. Fiscal year 20, 500,000 for replacement, 6.2 for maintenance. And uh, fiscal year 21 this year, we got $250,000, and we're trending to hit $6.5 million. Two things to note, a garbage truck costs $350,000. A rescue pump, a, res a pumper cost about $800,000. A rescue unit cost about $370,000. So you talk about us trying to get real creative with these funds. It's either through leasing or selling and scrapping to try to buy some vehicles. Um, I did put an asterisk there next to COVID. You can see in fiscal year 20, we got $500,000. And we still went above fiscal year 19, 6.2 million. It's important to note that when COVID hit, recreation departments stopped providing those services. So a lot of vehicles were not being used, yet the maintenance still went up. And that's just because of the age of the fleet. Aside from the hard cost, there's opportunity cost that we're losing as well. A decrease in efficiency is taking much longer for our team members to do their job, be it sanitation workers, streets workers, parts workers. Um, also the morale. Uh, these individuals, men and women, are paid. They're in the business of fixing things. And you want to see an upset employee take away their tools to complete a job. Um, overtime increase, downtime increased as well. And also process time. Because of the workload, a lot of things were just outsourced. So. There's a lot of redundancies in services. There's a cost to cut a check, a cost to write a contract, all those things that you don't factor in. That's you know what I like to consider opportunity cost. So a little bit of the history. Um, current situation, so what we do every year is, through our system, we kind of track all of the high maintenance assets. And once we identify those, we sit down with every division and department head and identify those assets and work with them collaboratively to identify what needs to be replaced and what it needs to be replaced with. Uh, so currently, we ended up categorizing them with critical replacements and recommended replacements. The list combined was actually $12 million. Um, I presented that to Armando. He gave me a funny look, so I walked away, and we cut out the recommended replacements and just focused on the critical replacements, and that was the $8 million that Administrator Johnson had spoke about. And that breakdown is community services, $40,000, fire rescue, 4.5, parks and recreation, 400,000, public works, 3 million. And I put 2 million, but uh, the police department had 
uh, presented weeks prior is 2.2 million for the total of 10.2. So that's the breakdown of the need. Um, and even though we needed 12 million, and I'm not one to turn down money, best management practices, we don't want to replace everything at once because that means that everything goes bad at once. So you want to cycle it in. But we identified $8 million as critical replacements uh, that provide services. A further fleet composition of what we're breaking down, fire rescue, 24 units. Those range from 1995 to 2014. Public works, 17 units from 2003 to 2015. Parks and Recreation, 10 units from 2002 to 2015. Community Services has one unit, 2003. The, the replacements include garbage trucks, rescue units, buses, mowers, trailers, trailers, and just numerous pieces of equipment that service the public. It's important to know, even though you see a 2015, uh, for certain units, like a fire rescue unit, like a garbage truck, that's a five-year life cycle. Uh, those first five years, you're going to have maintenance costs, but at that five-year mark, that's where you really want to sell that asset because we're seeing good money residuals. But when you start climbing into that set sixth and seventh years, when you start seeing those maintenance costs skyrocket. So I just want to you know, make sure people see that. When they see a 2015, uh, should have been replaced in 20, so it's past its life cycle costing us more money. So some of the impacts in the future, definitely an increased maintenance cost, uh, Increased downtime, service delays. We're starting to experience that now. Uh, teams coming in on Saturday and Sundays to make sure these garbage trucks are up and running. Uh, if you were to cut me a check today, six months to a year and a half, depending on the piece of equipment. If it's a pickup truck or something like that, or a trailer, we might get that in six months. If it's a rescue unit or a garbage truck, anywhere from a year to a year and a half. And also the police equipment, as I stated last week, would be like about a year. Uh, some good news to, to note. All those replacements, once they come in, we're going to sell those assets. So we will be seeing some surplus revenue with the sale of those assets. Being very conservative, I'm going to say a 10% residual from those assets, but I suspect, suspect more given our recent auctions. So that's some, some positive news uh, regarding the, the sales of those assets. And uh, the investments in replacement vehicles will allow for reduced costs, increased service efficiencies starting in uh, fiscal year 22-23 and allow the city to better manage and kind of have a level set so we can fund for future needs. And that's it. Any questions for Mr. Guzman? Okay, Ms. Johnson. Uh, we I'm sorry, Ms. we do have a question here. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you, um, and thank you for the presentation. Do you know what the total is of our entire fleet? What's the total value? So in other words, in, in the 10-ish million, what percentage of our fleet does that represent? I know there's a lot of numbers to crunch in there. We can, we can get that data. We have all the, the, if I had to take a guess, let me get back to you. I'll give you the exact figure. Uh, we can see the, the, the total value. I think sanitation department alone, if you just look at all their assets, uh, I want to say at least 80 million is just that fleet. Just with their, no, not even, I'm sorry, let me take it back. Um, Don't guess. Just, yeah, just, I'll get you the, the yeah. exact figures. What I'm trying to understand is how, how big of a push is this comparatively to the whole as we're going to phase this in over time, um, looking at the entire fleet. So this is going to take care of today, um, but then what do we have coming down the road? So looking at how, how big our fleet is and the, and the ages of our fleet, this will take care of us, but for how long? Well, this will take care of the critical needs. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, it's $12 million with the recommended replacements. The way it works in this business, you're not going to run a vehicle to the tires run off because it's too late by then. So we've identified $8 million that's critical that's needed right now. We're going to need $4 million next year. And then it's, a, it's just an approach of looking at, okay, we might have to replace some things a little bit sooner, extend some things out so that... For argument's sake, let's say you have 10 vehicles for the fire department. Let's say you have 10. You don't want to replace 10 at once. You don't want to replace five every five years. You want to do two, you know, two every, every five years so you have a fresh uh, vehicles coming in, and that allows you to have frontline units and reserve units. So to answer your question, $8 million will put us to be, you know, so we're not having crisis mode, and then the $4 million next year will put us in a better position to to start managing the fleet, but it has to happen every single year. I showed you, I think, one of the slides where, you know, 200,000, 500,000, that's just not sustainable. 
Sure, and, and I understand phasing things in over time so that your vehicles don't all age out at the same time. Um, just having a, a broader understanding of the bigger picture, I think, is what I'm looking for. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Lambert. Thank you for the presentation. Quick question about the slide in the beginning where you talked about is about on average about a half a million dollars in replacement budget and on average about 6.5 million in maintenance each year. Is, is that typical to be that imbalanced like that? No. Um, when it comes to fleet, you're always gonna have an expense. Your garbage trucks always break down, rescue convenience always break down. So you actually want to see more on your capital and less on your, uh, your maintenance budget because having more on the capital will allow us to increase our opportunity cost by having to increase in efficiencies, overtime, morale, all those kind of things. Um, once you get, we get to a good place, you know, our goal is I, ideally to pre-fund vehicles and treat vehicle replacements as an operating fund and not as a capital fund, not me sitting here, hey, we need breakdowns, we need money. We want to have it to, to where every vehicle is set up like an escrow account, you pay into it, and you know what's being replaced at what given time. So with these funds, it would allow us to at least have a level set to hopefully create that kind of program. Follow up. Thank you. So this was a trend years before COVID. Can you talk a little bit about how we got to that scenario? Um, I'm going to have to defer that to the previous administration. I, I, and uh, I mean, we made the numbers, but it was the funding issue. Yeah, uh, Assistant City Administrator Armando Fana. I mean, part, this is just uh, like a lot of things is we've never caught up to the previous downturn in the economy. And so the, the, the fleet, if you look at the fleet, the way it was managed previously, we've never gotten to a point where, as Mario said, we're, repla we're not only replacing vehicles, but we're setting up funds for future replacements. And so this, you know, get these additional funds, as he said, will kind of get us a level set to hopefully move forward with that type of, of, of uh, funding mechanisms where we're pre-funding and putting some money aside every year so we're not stuck in these crisis modes uh, year after year. But this goes back a very long time. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fox. Thank you for the presentation. I think it was the next slide after this slide that listed um, yeah, the the numbers um, totaling 10 million. I believe at the beginning, we said we were going to attribute 8 million to this, but not the 2 million to the police. And I was curious if the 2 million we're talking about here for the police vehicles is what we discussed with using for the unassigned fund balance for, or is it something that's just still in the air, something that we need to work out where that fund, those funds are gonna come from? If I could, Mayor, I can take yes. that. The 2 million, was part of the presentation uh, from uh, Captain Clark. The 1.6 million for this fiscal year is what the board approved uh, on a following uh, city commission meeting. The 2.2 million, which was uh, the actual number, is what the slide indicated was going to be needed for FY22. The uh, demarcation here is that uh, support services does not maintain police's fleet. So we've added it in this slide. Uh, under support services, they maintain all of the other department's fleet that are listed here. Police maintain their own fleet. But that does not mean that we have set aside the 2.2 million that police need. It's just maintained by police themselves. So the board will see that as part of the discussion when we get to the uh, proposed balanced budget. And uh, I want to uh, prepare the board that you're not going to see in the proposed balanced general fund budget uh, the two million for police. The money is not there, but we are footnoting that they do have a need and probably will come back and ask the board if it's not going to be included in uh, the funding here at some point they will come back and ask the board to approve it from discretionary fund balance. Follow up, yes. Thank you. Just to clarify, if we decided we wanted to use these funds that we're talking about today for the police fleet, is that appropriate or is it something we can't use these funds for? I would say that it would be premature in that we still have 
a pending threshold issue that's going to guide how much funds would be uh, left for the board to consider for vehicle replacement. So I would say that it would be premature until that uh, union impasse matter is settled by the board. I think it's premature to recommend dollar amounts for any of the categories. Okay, Commissioner Shove. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Administrator Johnson, I think my question is more for you on the, the theory of kind of taking this, these funds in particular and using it for this purpose. So uh, under the American Rescue Plan guidelines, we are using this money to replace lost revenue. Um, when we went through the budgeting process, there were a number of departments that squeezed down a lot of things out of their individual budgets. And so I guess when I see refunding lost revenue, I think of those individual departments and how they would get back some of those resources. Is the idea here that we are looking at replacing vehicles across a broad category of departments? And so when we look at the, the budget for um, next year, in essence, those departments wouldn't have to fund these needs and then those funds would be opened up to kind of help out with those, those things that were cut out of department budgets. Uh, no to the last question. These funds would not be uh, used uh, for department's budget. And we need to put this in the context of the two sides of the ledger. So department's budgets were cut back. Some of them cut into the bone, not to the bone. But that was on the operating side. These are one-time dollars. So these funds are recommended for items that fall into a one-time category, and that's capital. Because of where we were with the budget, departments were not permitted to include vehicles in their budget, and therein lies the crux of the issue of why we have this critical need. Now, departments didn't have capital in their budgets this year, but this trend goes back many, many years where because we didn't recover from the 2009 real estate recession, that was one of the sacrifices that departments made where they were not getting capital items, so it was not in their budget. In terms of replacing their resources, uh, I don't see us being in that position uh, for another few years because the operating budget has to be able to absorb that because it's an ongoing cost. Understood, and, and I think you answered my question in there. As far as a theory, we're looking at different, different pockets of money, and from a holistic point of view on every department, I think it sounds like the theory is to be able to use those different categories of funds to fulfill the needs and looking at the whole picture of a department versus trying to break it into pieces of operational versus capital. Uh, yes, but that's how I have to look at the budget. <laughs> That's how I have to look at it because you don't want to build your operating budget on one-time money because Understood. you're going to have a major hit and gap that ensuing year. So as a matter of best practice from a budgeting standpoint, you never build an operating budget on one-time money Understood. unless you have a guarantee revenue that's coming in the ensuing year to backfill that gap. So that would not be a practice that you will see me bring forward as your city administrator. Understood, administrator, very familiar with capital and operational budgeting. Um, I guess when I'm looking at this, where I'm trying to drill down and maybe I'm looking at it from a different angle is that if we're replacing lost revenue, the, the guidelines look at lost revenue completely over time, not necessarily just lost revenue due to COVID specifically, because obviously, this wasn't due to COVID specifically. This is a number of factors that have built up over time. And I guess that's just what I'm trying to understand in, in the guidance. Okay, so let me see if I can clarify that. And maybe the city attorney uh, can better articulate this than uh, me. The lost revenue has to be tied to COVID-19. However, the city has the discretion to then take the reimbursement of that lost revenue and apply it to needs that will help keep the city going, you know, as it relates to addressing uh, uh, issues that are related to COVID. So if I take fire rescue, for example, we need to have fire rescue trucks on the road 
to still continue to provide services to residents that may be impacted by COVID or a number of other things. So that's how the two relate. That, that explains it, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Guzman? Commissioner Lambert. And actually it's, it's for Administrator Johnson, but based on this slide here, I, I completely understand the statement that was made before we started this that we're still anticipating a public hearing regarding the impasse. What I just want some further clarification on is, Ms. Johnson, I'm hearing you say we're not making financial recommendations, but all I'm hearing that is relating to the two or 2.2 million related to the police. Is that correct? Because there's other numbers up here. I, I guess I just would like some, and I'm seeing heads nodding in different directions from this day, so it seems like there may be some confusion. Okay, let me make certain I'm understanding the question. We're not making funding recommendations at all. I'm not making a funding recommendation on the 2.2 related to police. I'm not making funding recommendations at all. So what I indicated is that if the police vehicles at whatever point the impasse matter gets settled, and then the board decides how it wants to allocate the $12.5 million here in these three categories. If it does not include enough to cover police vehicles, what I expect is that police is going to come back and ask the board to consider that out of discretionary unassigned fund balance. And I don't know if that answers your question. I think maybe some, some confusion may be these numbers are not recommended numbers. For no, this not at all. This is just the current situation. Yes, yes. This is the description of the situation. You're not recommending 8 million or 10 million be That spent. is correct. Okay. That Did, is correct. That clarify the confusion. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Mr. President. Uh, along those lines, I know Commissioner Fox had if I understood her question correctly, would was whether the funds would be appropriately used uh, on the police department fleet. And you had said it would be premature to consider that because we don't know where we are uh, with regard to the negotiations. Um, it would be an appropriate use potentially though, the police department fleet of these funds, just like any of these other categories. That is correct. correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions on this particular portion of the presentation? Okay, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you, I'm gonna have uh, Mr. Rodriguez to come up and give the board an overview of the various categories uh, that we are proposing be considered uh, for premium pay when we get to uh, the point of making decisions about uh, premium pay allocations. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, the purpose of my part of the presentation is to give you uh, an overview of the essential worker job classifications that we are recommending for discussion purposes for your consideration and also the number of uh, preliminary number of uh, employees that we believe would be uh, impacted and then of course have commission question and discussion on the items. A couple of key uh, points uh, setting this issue up is that the types of positions um, that we are proposing are not, as previously discussed, only public safety because there were a number of employees across uh, various classifications that kept different operations, whether at the water plants, out in the community, in the parks, in City Hall, running, which support you know all of the services that the city provides, including public safety services. Um, the estimated number of employees that, um, that would be deemed essential under our uh, proposal for consideration is about 1,275. The reason why you don't see all 1,685 FTEs is because employees that regularly work remotely during the pandemic emergency cannot receive American Rescue Plan funds, so those automatically have to be taken off the table. Um, so you will see in later slides, uh, slides where you have more job classifications that employees that would be affected because we would have to go by each classification uh, that you wind up all approving and then you know kind of tease out the employees that you may have two employees in the same classification but one worked remotely and one didn't and the one that didn't 
gets the, the COVID premium pay. The ones that came in here or were out in the community get the COVID pay, but the ones that work remotely uh, will not, even though they may have the same job title. Um, and uh, when we add up all of the classifications, all of the preliminary classifications across public safety, the unions, and non-public safety, it comes out to about 229 different job titles. Uh, job classifications and job titles is an interchangeable term in HR terms. So the first group is public safety. Um, our estimate is that that would affect about 294 uh, positions represented by the FOP in those categories that you see there, police officer, sergeant, lieutenant, and then the non-sworn members of the FOP, uh, crime scene investigator, community service aide, latent print examiner, and senior latent print examiner. Similarly, uh, for the fire positions, uh, we would have a, approximately 250 employees in those five categories of firefighter, captain, battalion chief, lieutenant, and driver engineer. For the PMSA, the Professional Managers and Supervisors Association, um, uh, our initial estimate is approximately 45 positions. Uh, but there, as I previously mentioned, you see more than 45 job classifications because we would have to go through each job classification and, and determine which of those people qualify. But all of these positions that we are recommending um, on for PMSA, non-union non uh, uh, employees, and for SEIU, were arrived at by looking at the types of functions that those positions performed and whether those positions for the most part would have been positions that would have likely been performing duties in person versus performing duties, job duties remotely. Uh, and that's what led um, to, the, to the compilation of this list. So there is a, a logical reason why some positions are here and some positions may not be here. And of course, this is just a draft for discussion purposes that's subject to the input and the you know, uh, the commission and the mayor. For the SEIU union, we similarly see that we would, we think we would probably be approximately 312 positions or employees that would be affected in these various uh, job classifications, which range from telecommunicators that reported on uh, in person to uh, uh, process 911 calls, uh, parks maintenance workers, street sweepers, sanitation workers, irrigation takers. We also see administrative assistants because some administrative assistants because of their functions couldn't work remotely, others could. Um, so some of those uh, administrative assistants also would be impacted um, and would may qualify for any premium pay the city may decide um, to, um, to award or to budget for. For the non-union represented uh, positions, uh, a rough estimate is 374 positions across these various job titles um, upon our initial review. And they, they run the gamut from you know, clerical and administrative positions to some, uh, to some supervisory positions uh, and specialized positions. So in, in, to, in summary, that 1,275 uh, estimate of affected employees that I mentioned in my first slide is comprised of the 200, 294 for the police uh, union, uh, 250 in the fire union, 45 in the PMSA union, 312 in the SEIU union, and then non-union employees about 374 to get to that t uh, title, to that total. Um, and that uh, represents about over 229 job classifications that would be up for consideration. And with that, I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Any questions, Commissioner? I mean, I'm President Peduzzi. Thank you, Mayor. Just, just my thoughts. Um, I think that it would be appropriate for there to be like three classifications of employees those that were frontline workers who had close and daily contact with the public, not necessarily just first responders, because there's other, there's other frontline workers who are out there and, and showed up to work and, and had close contact, had no choice but to be in people's houses or you know, one on one with people. And then the next category would be those who came to work, were physically present, uh, worked behind the scenes and had had some contact maybe with the public maybe with a, a screen in front of them or you know uh, that kind of, of contact not necessarily the kind of exposure that the frontline workers would have and then third the category that I guess would not even be considered regardless because they're not eligible under under this um, would be those that reworked remotely but I think that so can there be a graduated 
premium pay, that, that those who had the most exposure that were on the front lines get the, get the lion's share of the premium pay and then have it graduated down depending on the duties that they had to perform during the pandemic? Well, we are not recommending amounts per employee category. So in terms of the final list of categories that would qualify, um, the number of employees that would qualify, and whether those employees are divided into one or two or three groups and what amount each group receives, that is all subject to um, the direction of the mayor and the commission. We are not recommending it. The, purpose, the, the way that we uh, presented this presentation is at a higher level just so that you can get a ballpark of how many employees may be affected uh, and how many job categories may be affected, but how that's divided and teased out and budgeted would be a, a direction from, from this, the dais. And, and, and Mr. Rodriguez is right. We, we don't know yet how big the pie is that we're gonna have to divide. Uh, and that will affect uh, our approach, our thinking. Once we determine the size of the pie, we could come back with more specific recommendations. But your point is, is uh, noted. Uh, Commission, I'm sorry, uh, Madam City Attorney, do you have something to add? I, I did, and j this is just a, a, to assist you and guide your discussion sure. in, in this regard. I just want to read from the um, interim rules as it relates to premium pay. It says, to ensure that premium pay is targeted to workers who faced or face heightened risk due to the character of their work, the interim final rule defines essential worker as work involving regular in-person interactions or regular physical handling of items that were also handled by others. And we will take that into account when we're coming up. Uh, Commissioner Shove. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think what would be helpful is, I know we're not recommending specific amounts, but if we could talk about the parameters, there were parameters listed like something $13 per hour, not to exceed 150%, et cetera. If we could understand a, a minimum and a maximum, if you will, um, to understand um, what the financial commitment could be from the city. Again, I know not a recommendation, but I think it's, it's difficult for me to, to look at the numbers that we have and understand where financially we would be, you know, at at the following the guidelines because these guidelines give us certain parameters as well so i don't know if there's some way to quantify it um again i understand the nuance of of having uh, an upcoming public hearing of which different evidence will will be presented etc um but it will be even difficult in that circumstance to understand where financially we have 24 million dollars that we're looking at in total this need and various other needs i guess it would be um, important to know where we would fall at a maximum level and where we would fall at a minimum level um, based upon employee category. If you could c kind of explain, even if just given one, one position, um, be it an administrative position, what an example of premium pay would look like for that position within the minimum and maximums of the parameters. Let me take that. You know, at this point, there is no way that we can establish, you know, what a minimum would look like and what a maximum would look like in that the mayor and the board has full discretion to just determine the dollar amount that you want to allocate toward each employee group that you determine to be eligible for premium pay. So it's, 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 it's literally impossible to establish what a minimum would be and what a maximum would be. You know, uh, theoretically, the board could say after you look at the list of categories uh, based on some sort of definition, if we take uh, Commissioner uh, Paduzzi's uh, example by frontline and then that second category, the board could determine for that second category we want to just give X dollar amount. And if you want to do a delta between that second category and the first category, then we're going to do an up, a, a, a variance increase of X amount to the first category. So it's very difficult, uh, Commissioner uh, Show, to do, you know, a range, you know, unless the board uh, says uh, we're going to allocate this total dollar amount for premium pay. 
and administration, we want you to go back and then decide, you know, based on all of the positions that we support as eligible for it to determine uh, how you want to do by ranges. But I think doing it by ranges is, is inappropriate. It, it's just a, a lump sum amount. Yeah, and I, I understand. I think that's why I'm trying to get some parameters around just understanding how the guidance is laid out. It, and, and maybe what you're saying is it's completely an open book as to what, what we can do here, but is it typically, so just as I look at um, category to category, is premium pay determined typically by job title? Is it determined, I'm struggling whenever we, we started out here and said something about $13 an hour, do you take an hourly premium pay and apply it to someone's pay typically? How, how is this determined, or is it just determined by us sitting as a board and saying, as a lump sum, um, each job category is awarded this, this amount? I think it's determined by, I'll let the city attorney, but I think for the most part, it's determined by the lateral, you know, by the board. But I think there is some guidance in, yeah, in The in information whatnot. that was provided in the presentation was just that, it's guidance. And uh, what it said was you can pay, I mean, it put, it put the maximums on the table. So it says to, to you, the guidance documents, you can pay up to $13 an hour and no more than $25,000 per person. That's your maximum. But okay. you, your minimum and how you do the re remainder of it is, is up to you. And then it gives you additional guidance. We want you to focus on the lower income wage earners. We want to make sure that if you want to provide money to folks who are the higher wage earners, that you provide that justification when it's over 150% of the state or the county um, average for that particular job title. So there are some parameters, but they're really just guideposts to help you in making your final determination. Okay, thank you. And, and commissioners, uh, we will come back to you with more specific recommendations. This is kind of a two-part discussion. The, the first part is just so you could see, and there's more background information, the, 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 the number of categories, job titles, et cetera. Uh, but as we f and go, going back to my pie analogy, once we figure out the size of the pie, uh, then we will you know, crunch the numbers and make recommendations to you. Uh, and so we'll have that second conversation. Uh, but, but you're not expected to, you know, just pull numbers out of the, the air to, to come up. We, we will uh, do that analysis, keeping in mind the guidelines and, and recommendations that, that have been set forth. And when we come back to you, we will have a, uh, uh, the, the, the business case laid out as, as to what our recommendations are, why we made the recommendations, and then we'll have a more informed discussion as, as a group. Uh, so this is kind of a two-stage uh, conversation here, and, and we're just entering the first stage. That is correct. Uh, Commissioner Fox. Thank you for the presentation, and thank you, Mayor, for that explanation. Uh, my question is, I guess, going forward, I you know spent the last year working at home, and so I am very supportive of premium pay for all those who <clears throat> had to come in to keep our city running. But I also think it would be helpful for me if going forward when we make our final decisions, I know that there are some categories that were given at least cost of living allowance raises last year. And there are other unions that we are still negotiating with that did not have a contract at all. We're not given any um, raises, premium pay, anything like that. So it would be helpful for me to know in those categories that you presented if we could see which of those um, job titles were given um, a cost of living allowance last year so that we could help make our decisions. Well, that question I can answer based on the presentation because in this slide you see non-union uh, positions. Non-union positions did not receive an across the board last year. So if you were a member of the public safety unions or SEIU or PMSA, you received a cost of living adjustment. If you were a non-union employee across various categories from management all the way to, to across all the departments, if you were not in a union, you did not receive a cost of living. So that's, you know, that, that would help you. But we, we try to, when we develop these types of recommendations, to have some consistency so that you don't have a situation where within a jo one job classification, you've got, you know, one person receiving this much of a stipend who has the title Perfect example is administrative assistant. You had some administrative assistants that were part of a union that received a COLA and others that didn't. So when you start getting into a, a 
COVID pay and you start saying, well, these administrative assistants are going to get $150, just for argument's sake, but these are going to get $200, they're within the same category, so you try to have a uniformity and equity. So, so I would just that would just be the only, from an HR perspective, the only concern that I would ask you to to, to consider that that as simple as you could make it is better. Yeah, Mr. Rodriguez, I think we can also answer the question on what groups actually receive uh, COVID uh, stipend. We know that uh, public safety mm -hmm. received a COVID stipend of twelve hundred dollars. PMSA received six hundred dollars, and SEIU did not receive a COVID stipend, and neither did any of the non-union employees receive uh, a COVID stipend. So that right. has already been provided. We 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 know that. And, and when we come back to you, we will have that information available to you to remind you. We'll make sure we have that as part of the uh, presentation for the second phase, the backup. Okay? I'm, I'm asking. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions of Mr. Rodriguez, comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioners, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Johnson. 